And this morning, if you're here, I just want to say, if you're a guest, welcome. This is, it's awesome to be able to join uh, together in the Lord's presence. And just, uh, what, what a great time. And, um, you know, one of the things that we love to do here is have fun. Look at your neighbor and say, this is going to be fun. Look at your second choice and said, it's about time. We always have that second choice, don't we? Well, this morning, let's, as we dive into God's Word, I just, we were taking some time to look back, and the name of this series is I Church. Last week, we, we talked about how, as a church, one of our values is to love. It's in our vision. We said that every one of these statements around us, these core values you see on the wall, they're held in place by love. What a powerful word as we love. BFA was established in 1934, but existed. That's when it came into the Dis Mississippi District Council of the Assembly of God. It was established a couple of years before that of families meeting in a home, gathered together to worship the Lord, to build something, to leave a legacy, to see the Spirit of God poured out in a powerful way. Some of you will remember this and. In 2005, our family came. Hard to believe that this last year we celebrated 10 years here. And what God has done, I've watched my boys grow up here. Uh, we've, we've loved on many of you through the years. We've been loved on by you. We, we've celebrated this journey together as God has brought us and, uh, and, and, and connected us all part of the history and the legacy of such a wonderful church. Some of you were part of the vision team that went through, that we went through in 2011 as we begin to lay a course for the future, the preferred destiny of this church, where we see God taking us. Building off of that 80-something years of history, we said, God, we're not done. We believe that you're not finished with us, and that we're moving forward. And we begin to, to meet and, and, and strategize about how God would take us into the next place, how God would lead us to the next uh, level uh, that he was preparing for us. And through that, we put together some visions and, some, and a dream. That's what this statement was birthed out of. We didn't just throw that together and just decide that, hey, that sounded good on paper. How many of you remember the wall with butcher paper on it? How many of you remember all the, I mean, everyone put, put a slogan up there, and we, we, we began to hash out what we believed and what the future of the church was. And, 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 and we had people that were 70-year-old in the room and people who were, who were 14 in the room, and we found out that the vision for, for the future of BFA was not that different. That regardless of age, we wanted to see the Spirit of God poured out. We wanted to see lives change. We wanted to see God do a great work in this city. Many times when a pastor goes into a, a place, a location, the first thing that pastor is often asked is, what is your vision? I believe, that, I believe that a pastor has to have a vision, but I believe it's so much more important that a church knows its vision. That we know why God wired us and what our DNA is and how we were designed and why God called us to this city and to this place and that we stay true to the vision with which we set out. And what we did in the course of sitting in that room and, and, and talking and digging deep and asking those questions was we begin to flesh out why we were called, what our mission was, what our vision was, to love God, to live the life, to share Christ. Those of you who it knows what it takes to build that, you remember how much work is really there. Because it encompasses, in such a short phrase, such a massive vision. But it was our dream. It still is our dream. We haven't arrived. We, we have come along the journey. But, but a church, that's like so many in history, if we ever lose sight of the vision, if we ever lose focus of our mission, then it's easy to fall back into a rut. How do you know what a rut is? It's a, it, it's a grave that's just shallow on the ends. And that's not our passion, but we, what we want to do is keep moving forward. And last week we talked about each of these mis being mission-minded, community-focused, cross-cultural as a church, uh, having life-changing discipleship. We talked about passionate servanthood. And of course, 
operating in spirit-led worship. And today, I want to bundle a couple of those together and talk to you about the power of empowerment. That one of the passages here at BFA is to empower the believer to do ministry. That's why you see life-changing discipleship. That's why you see passionate servanthood. Because we're passionate about empowering believers to live out the mission of the church. That when we talk about life, that's what we're talking about. That's why these G2 groups are so important. Because they're going to be the catalyst for us to live where we're called to live. They're going to help you get through some of those down times. They're going to help you grow. They're they're a great place. You see, I would love to tell you that, that, that coming and hearing pastor sermons would grow you and mature you and get you where you need to go spiritually. But I can tell you that it's not enough. That discipleship through relationship is a powerful tool. That's why Jesus spent so much time with 12 when he first began his ministry. That's why you see guys like Paul would take someone like Timothy under his wing, someone like Luke along the journey with him, because it was the power of life-changing discipleship, of relationship that had the ability to bring real discipleship. I want to tell you that these G2 groups have the power to bring exactly that. And we set out wanting to build a church that didn't celebrate bricks and mortars, mortar, didn't celebrate buildings. I I like buildings. we got a great building. God's given us land. We're doing stuff. But how many of you know that's not a church? A church is not about nickels and noses. It's about people. It's not just about the count on Sunday morning. It's about changed lives. It's about us living out our faith. It's about us letting God speak and operate through us and seeing God change the world around us through our obedience as we live it out every day. It's about allowing God to display His glory through someone else's life. You see, along the way, many of those who forget, they become focused on bricks and mortar. They become institutionalized. And I don't want that for the, us. I want us to remember that God's heart is about people and that our heart is to be about people. And I told you this over. I've told you this this day one that I, I, that I stood in this pulpit that as long as there was still one person in Brookhaven, for, there would still be a mission for First Assembly. That, that when we get here, if somehow we arrived and we fill this building up, there's still a mission field. Some churches, they, they, get, they get numbers where they want them. They're like, we're comfortable. we got plenty of people. But you see, it's not the numbers that drive the mission. It's the completion of the number when all are in. And as long as there's one, I'm reminded of the story that Jesus told, that he left 99 to go find one. As long as there's one. You see, I don't know. That one might be your son, your daughter. It may be your brother, your sister. That one's important. Which one, when you look around this room today, which one is not here? I challenge you at the first of this year, I gave you a lifesaver, remember that? Which one have you been praying for? Which one are you believing that God will bring into this church, into their, that they will come into relationship with Christ before the year's out? Who's your one? I want a church that's passionate about people. We spoke last week about what love can do. I love. And we talked about how important it was that we love this journey. That what, what we love, we, we, we look forward to. What we love, we enjoy. And how we need to enjoy life again. We need to love life. We need to love God. We need to love people. And this morning, I want to take just a moment to, to, to just break down and talk to you about being empowered. I am empowered. The I church. That we want a church that empowers you as a believer, as a disciple. Next week we're going to look at I encounter. And we're going to talk about encountering God on spiritual levels. And we're going to take communion. We're going to have a time. Of, we're going to change the service up just a little bit. Come back for that. Don't miss it. You're like, what's going on? I'm not going to tell you. You won't come back. 
I'm not done. I, my mama, I, I wasn't born yesterday. I, I told you this was going to be fun. Y'all not being fun right now. Y'all just kind of like, anyway. Because I mean, without his presence, it's nothing. And next week, we're going to look at how important it is to have an encounter. You see, if we don't have an encounter with God, all this is empty. All this is just routine. Talk to you next week a little bit about how to, how to make every time you walk through this building an encounter with God. Our theme verse, if you're taking notes, write this theme down. It's on the scripture. It's on the wall behind me. We're looking at a passage of scripture from Daniel. Now, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the sand traps. Now, notice that. He distinguished himself. He wanted to live like no one else, so he lived like no one else. He decided he was going to do something. And he began to live contrary to the norm. I want to tell you, if you want to live like, if you want a life like no one else, you've got to live different than the norm. As long as we look like the world around us, as long as we live like the world around us, we're just going to fall in with everything else. But when we begin to live different, by his exceptional qualities, in other words, these values, it will take these values. He began to live by some exceptional qualities. And, and, and here's the truth this morning, whether you're, you're here at BFA for the first time or this is your home, the reality is that these, these values, if we take these exceptional values and qualities into our life, we have the power to not only change this world, not only to live differently here as a believer, but they'll change your business, they'll change your home. Those exceptional qualities, look, read on with me. By his exceptional qualities, the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. You see, when we hold to those exceptional values that God gives us, God brings elevation in our life. People take notice. They see character in us. When we don't live by the world's normal. You know, I, I, I shared with someone the other day, actually I shared with my son, uh, He's, he's entered the workforce officially last year. And I said, you know, here's the reality. I said, work hard. Never make your boss look for something to tell you to do. You see, so many today, they, 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 they want to check and they don't want to work to get that. They want to do as least possible to get a payday. That's not exceptional value. Exceptional value is working hard. Being an individual who, who realize they have the privilege to make a difference even on the job they work. Whether it's slinging hamburgers or whether it's moving hardware or whether it's working on a computer, the reality is that we have the power to make a difference. I'm preaching a lot better than you're amen in this morning. You guys... I'm telling you, if you live by exceptional qualities, you'll accomplish a lot in your life. And not only will you accomplish a lot in your life, if we live as, by them as a church, we'll accomplish great and mighty things for the kingdom. Empowered. Here's why it's so important this morning. You, you know, many, many of us, we grew up, I, I grew up, uh, when I grew up, I grew up in Louisiana, and there was a particular ministry that was so dominant in Louisiana at the time, and particularly in our fellowship, our denomination. And, and I remember watching that individual rise to superstar status and, and how so many people look. Yeah, you, you could go to downtown Baton Rouge and there, there was a whole street with buildings and, and, and Bible colleges with their name plastered on it and, and all types of, of, of mega buildings built. And, and we see often, in, in, particularly in my generation, we saw these guys uh, build these kingdoms, and then they, they spend all this time raising money to support that kingdom, and, and they, they try to get people to come on board so you could help further the vision that I have. Also watch those crumble and fall. And often we see very little about really building people, but often building their vision. You see, few people ever encounter church, encounter church and say that a church empowers people. But that's what we want to do here. We want you to find your purpose. We want you to pursue what God has laid on your heart. 
We dream of a church where every individual has found their purpose and they're investing in the kingdom. Whatever it is God's called you to do, that you're making a difference on your level. See, some of this stems back to church history, the way we think about church, seeing these mega ministries, seeing these individuals build these kingdoms. And, and, and let me just do some history here. Some of it starts back to the Old Testament. We, we flip back to the Old Testament to a guy by the name of Abraham, and God calls Abraham. He speaks to Abraham, and because Abraham obeyed, God says, listen, Abraham, if you're willing to obey me, I'll make you a great nation. And so God calls Abraham out. You know this story. Through Abraham comes Isaac, and from Isaac comes Jacob, and from Jacob comes 12 sons who will become the 12 tribes of Israel. God changes Jacob's name to Israel. That's where we get Israel. And, and then we find they go into bondage. They go into Egyptian bondage, but it's there that God multiplies them and he makes them a great people. It's later in the, we find Moses is delivering them. He's bringing them out of bondage. God's delivering. Moses is leading the way. And God wants to reveal himself to his people and they stop and they say, whoa, 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 whoa. Moses, you go talk to God. You, we don't, we, we're fearful. And we find where God wanted to reveal himself to his people, but they didn't want to hear. So what God winds up doing is using Moses' brother, who's a Levite, to establish a priesthood. And the high priest would go in to the Holy of Holies, and he would go into the ark, and he would take care of all the ritualistic and all the, 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 the uh, sacrifices that had to be done. To, in other words, you didn't talk to God on your own. You would come to the priest and he would go talk to God on your behalf. If you had committed sin, he would, you would bring an offering and he would go and present it. He would go in for you. There was, this, the, you, there was a special anointing on him, a special anointing upon the Levites, and there was a special class. They were Levites. They were high priests and priests of their day. But the average person couldn't enter into God's presence. The average person couldn't go in. And while we look at the Old Testament, we see it was a pattern of things, but it wasn't God's intent. And we see this because Jesus steps on the scene, and all of a sudden, he starts changing the verbiage. And Jesus starts using words like, when you talk to your father, pray like this. And he uses these, 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 these phrases that upset a lot of the religious people of their day. Number one, he didn't look like the religious people. He didn't dress like them. He didn't talk like them. And, and he hung around people they sure didn't like to hang around with because Jesus hung around what they called sinners. He hung around the, the tax collectors and the, and, the, and, and the common people. What's amazing is that the religious didn't like him very well, but the common people really loved him. And Jesus talked to them. He looked at them and said, you will be the salt of the earth. You are a light set on a hill. Us? You're talking about us? No, there's no way. We're, we're never as holy as the Pharisees. We're never as good as the Sadducees. And Jesus was saying, wait a minute. There's coming a day when we don't need to worship in Jerusalem or Judea, but you're going to worship. God's looking for worshipers who will worship in spirit and in truth. God was changing the playing field. And Jesus came with a message like that. And he talked to them about, talking to them about saying, when you pray, pray to your Father. That one day you won't need a mediator, but you yourself will go into God's presence. He proved it by the power of the Holy Spirit. He poured out his Holy Spirit on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the day of Pentecost. And you know what? It didn't just fall on 12 disciples. It fell on everybody present. Because God had changed the playing field. Oh, come on, he changed the playing field. And all of a sudden, now, there's this, everyone's a high priest. Everyone has the ability to be, have this anointing of the Holy Spirit. And everyone is the temple of the Lord. And the Lord is residing in every believer. And then he goes on to say, you know what? It's not enough that it's just going to be Jews anymore. I'm going to pour it out on the Gentiles like Cornelius. And God begins to pour it out upon the nations. And he even calls Paul to take the gospel and the, and the power of the Holy Spirit into the Gentile nations. And God begins to turn the world upside down. 
And then when you get through the Bible and you get to past that early church, what we do as creatures of habit, we go back to the old. And, so, and, and when the church age is over, you find that we go back to having priests. The average person doesn't have, is not able to read the Bible. They're not able to read the Scriptures in their name. They have to have someone read the Bible and tell them what it says. And, and if, you, if you have sin, you come to the priest and, he'll com- and confess it to him and he'll forgive your sin. He'll talk to God on your behalf. And it's so far from what Jesus established. So church history goes along and there's this Protestant Reformation. A guy by the name of Martin Luther says, wait a minute, I believe in the priesthood of every believer. That every believer, but, but, and, we, and we begin to preach a different message, but how many of you know that we still do the same thing? We develop words like clergy. This, this is a fancy word for those in ministry that, that they are equipped. They are more educated than other people, and therefore they are set a little bit higher. They are clergy. They're professionals at what they do, contacting God. You need a prayer, you need a clergyman. Call him. He's better. When he speaks, God listens. And we begin to develop this. Matter of fact, we come up with another word called laity which means common, average. You see, laity, they're just average. They they don't abound in spiritual things. That's for the clergy. And we built this hierarchy and this divide. Oh, I know you didn't want that this morning, but that's what we did. And we find ourselves some 2,000 years later, some 500 years later from the Reformation, and you guys are here in Mississippi, and you look at me and you say, you are preacher." And we still put labels on it. In reality, we hire a minister to do the work, and he'll do ministry. And we, and we do. We set our churches up that way. The, the congregation makes all the decisions, and the preacher does the ministry. And when we find that early church, the leaders led, and the body did the ministry. I said the leaders led, and the body did the ministry. It's in here. I didn't create it. And what we need to do today is go back to that kind of principle. Because what we've done is we've limited the size of the church because we've said it's, it's got to be about the pastor. You know, I've got to have the pastor to pray for me. How many of you know that my prayers are no more powerful than yours? I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I don't get a special card. and when I, well, I do get a card. But when I get that card, it doesn't mean God somehow listens to my, my, my prayers more than he listens to yours. And that's why a lot of times when you'll ask me to, to pray for you, I say, well, I will agree with you. Because if you think somehow my prayers are magical, that yeah, I can run into your situation and pray for you, and somehow God listens and hears it, I'm telling you, your prayers are powerful. Your prayers are powerful. The body, God called us to do ministry. We see it lived out to that early church. And, and I just want to say that we, we, we've walked away because what we've done, it, what it happens is it's, it's robbed us of the potential of what God can do through our lives and through the church. We've mixed it all up. We, we mix up this building. We act like this building is the church. And then we get, we get hung up on what it looks like and what color the walls. And is there a picture of Jesus? Is there a cross in the building? Is there, what happened to the picture of Jesus with the little lamb? You know, the one with every church is supposed to have a picture of Jesus with the little lamb around his neck. Anybody grow up in a church with a picture of Jesus with a little lamb around his neck? I'm just checking. How many of you know this? That this building was never the church, you're the church. That when God came, he didn't reside in buildings, he resided in, in people. Paul writes and says that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And that means that when you show up on your job, First Assembly has just showed up, the church has just showed up. When you show up in a hospital room, when you show up in a nursing home, when you show up on a visitation, when you pick up the phone to make a phone call, God has just showed up because you are operating in an anointing, a priesthood, a 
priesthood. An office, a call, an anointing upon your life. And we use words like reverend. I, I, can I just tell you, as a pastor, I despise, the only time I ever sign it is on some kind of legal binding no, document because I have to. I get, I get letters from, from, from our high, uh, Springfield and from other places all the time, and it has reverend Jim in it, and I just disdain. Who am I? There's only one to be reverend. Call me pastor all you want to. I don't mind that. But I disdain that word reverend. I remember having some ladies that passed through here one time from up north and some dear sisters, and they, they had come in for prayer. That, during that time, our offices was upstairs, and I said, sure, you guys can come. We'll come and we'll pray together. And we began to pray. And they asked me when they were done, they, they said, and so what's your title? It took me off for a moment. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, are you a bishop? Are you, um, are, 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 are you the honorable? I said, listen, you've got to have a name. Just call me pastor. Just call me pastor. The idea of the name like bishop or, you know, I think sometimes we get so stuck in titles and we've mixed this all up. And God never dreamed it to be that way, but he called and equipped the church. He prepared the church. He gave gifts. He gave leaders to the church. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. He gave leaders to the church to equip the saints to do ministry. One of the reasons we changed the way we used to do this around the front, we used to have prayer time, and it was about pastor and his little disciples, and pastor would run, and then their little disciples, the five disciples, would follow him. And I said, guys, this is not the way it's supposed to be. I said, you are called, you're the elders of the church. The Bible says that you're, that if there's any sick, let them call for you. Let them ask you to come and anoint them and pray a prayer of faith that they might be whole. That there is power in, in what God has established. You say, well, Pastor, you say that, people may not give you pastor appreciation gifts. They may look at you differently. I don't care. Because at the end of the day, I want to empower you to do the ministry God called you to do. Because I love you. I want to see you fulfilling the call in your life. And there's some things that have robbed us for so many years. Because we don't see things the way God has seen. i, I got to move along this morning. So it has to do with the way we see the picture. Jesus saw this. And look at Mark chapter 8 on the screen behind me. Jesus uh, and his disciples went on to a village and around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked them, he says, who do you say that I am? And some replied and said, you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah. Others just say you're a prophet. And he stops and he says, who do you say that I am? And so here's the question is, one, who do you say that he is? Because the way we see God will definitely impact the way whether we're empowered or not. Whether we believe that God can work through our life or not. Whether we believe God can do great and powerful things in and through our life. So you cannot be empowered with the wrong view. You can't operate that way. And, and so I want, I want you to help. I want to help you see the way God, four different ways we often see God. Three of them are a bad operating system. Three of them will leave you empty and powerless. One of them will empower you. The first one is a locked gate. Many of us, we see that, that, that ministry is a locked gate. We see, think that it's exclusive. That it's only for those who have gone to Bible school. That, that this book is too complicated for you to ever understand. And so, you preacher, you just tell me what's in it. And we think that somehow that, that, that it, 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 the gate is locked and we can never hear from God. We can never be used of God. And religion has turned this into a club mentality. You pay your tithe, you get three funerals and a wedding. Anything over that's above and beyond. That's okay, that's a joke. You can laugh there, no tension. And we do, we turn it into a club. I pay my tithe and this is what I get for it. It's like membership benefits and we forget what we're really in this thing for. We're in it to change lives.
Some of you are led by, by a doctrine you grew up with. And, and, and that doctrine is that there's only a certain amount going to heaven. And God's pretty much picked and chose them beforehand. And I just want to tell you that the Bible says that he would that none should perish, but all come to repentance. That everybody's got a part in this game. And that when it talks about those whom God predestined, he was talking about mankind as a whole. That he would that none should perish. That he had made a way that anyone who would believe could enter the kingdom. And don't let that rob you because some of you think, it's not for me. And let me tell you, it's not about titles. It's not about parking spaces. One thing I told somebody early on, I said, listen, I will never have a parking space that says pastor, preacher, reverend. I'll part with any. Matter of fact, I believe in this. I part far. I would say I set far, but I don't. I, I set pretty right up front. But I part far, set close. It can't get any closer than this, Brother Jeff. It's pretty close. You see, what I'm telling you is that it's not about titles or positions. And some of you, you see God is a locked gate, and that's why you don't think God can use you. Other ones, you, see, you look at it like a pile of luggage. And all you see is your past and what you've done and where you've been. And you say, you can't ever use me. You can't ever use me. And, and God can never do anything great with me. And all you can see is your failures and your mistakes and your bra- you, you, where you've messed up. And God says, listen. And, let me, and just hear this this morning. God is far more concerned with your future than he is your past. You think God and the church judges you by your past. And I want to tell you, we don't. This church don't. I said, this church don't. That's what I was looking for. Can I just tell you, when you look through Scripture, you find the ones that God used the most was often the ones that were the most messed up. Moses, a murderer. David, an adulterer. Paul was on his route to an execution. When God said, watch this. You want to shake a few things up? We're going to save this guy, and we're going to use him to to write two-thirds of the Scripture. On his way to an execution. Rahab, in the lineage of Jesus, was a harlot, a prostitute. Mary Magdalene. What about Matthew? He was a thief. He was a tax collector. I thought that'd be funny. It's tax season. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, okay. Apparently some of you ain't paid it yet, so. Can I just tell you, God doesn't care about your luggage. He wants to set you free from it. All that baggage you carry. I've had people walk me and tell me, you know, this is the first church that's really loved me and embraced me. I know people who have asked, had churches ask them to leave because of their past. I'm going to tell you, when people walk through that door, they're walking into their future. Come on, give him praise. Some of you see it as an endless ladder. I'll never get there. There's 800 classes and something to do next, and you get frustrated because you're working. And the problem is that you're trying to work for your salvation. I just want to tell you, you can't work that much. And listen, we want everybody to find where you're supposed to work, but we don't want you to overwork either because some of you can, can, can work yourself to death. And I, we've had people walk through the door and say, listen, I'm just wore out. And we just tell you, hey, take a little while and get where you need to be. Take a little while and, 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 and get refilled and get overflowing and we'll know the timing is right because all of a sudden there's a desire in you to do great and mighty things and when all of a sudden you have that desire come find us we'll put you to work we'll let you plug in i just want to tell you that it's important that you understand that it's not an endless ladder god's got a work for you to do but it's not that it's not built your salvation your connection with god is not built off of what you do this next one's the one that changes you. It's powerful. And you'll find that everything about God has these words in it. Because everything he's given us is this way. It's a free gift. You see, you have to see it as a free gift. Everything we have in this world is attached to something, but his is a free gift. You see, there's no price on it. You didn't pay for it. You, can't, you don't deserve it. It's a free gift. One of the biggest misperceptions of faith today or religion 
is that somehow we're going to earn our salvation. Paul writes and says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. In other words, you didn't accomplish this on your own ability. It is the gift of God. Not by works, so that anyone could boast. It blows me away when I think about how God's used my life. How he's worked through me. Paul tells Timothy, he says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love in Christ Jesus. You see, I just want to tell you today that God doesn't see you like you used to be. He sees you holy. He sees you through the blood of his son. He sees you. And can I just remind you that what you did, God God doesn't have this list and he keeps it over here. And then when when you do something wrong, he brings back all this over here. He doesn't do that. The Bible says that, that, that when you ask for forgiveness, he removes it as far as the east is from the west. I think that's amazing in my own sin because David would write those words, the psalmist would write those words some, from thousand years before any ex- polar expedition. You know, you can go north and there is a north pole. There's a start and stop. You can go south and there's a south pole. There's a start and stop. But you can just walk east for the rest of your life. As far as the east is from the west. It's infinite. And God chooses to remove your sins when you ask him. And he doesn't bring them out. You see, many times you're there and you're reminding God of what you've done. And God says, listen, I don't even have a record of that. I don't even see that. But your luggage, your luggage will hold you back. You see, we have to get the correct view and see ourselves like God sees us. He sees the potential that lays within you. He sees the purpose and the destiny he's placed Paul writes in Acts on the screen behind me. Some of you wonder why I was going to pick that up. I figured I had to get dry enough. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do as he says, not a locked gate, not a pile of luggage, not a ladder. But he gives you an open door. An open door. And so, I want to invite you this morning to take the journey with us. To go into the future where God is calling us to be empowered. That's why we have place. We want you to discover where God wants to plug in. We want you to find your capacities. As a leader, our heart is to grow people. And can I just tell you, there's ministry goes on here all the time that, that, that most people know nothing about. And you know what? They're not pastor-driven. Cheryl is in, is in the jail every week, sometimes multiple times, serving, ministering. Never once have I said, Cheryl, you need to get in the jail. That was God speaking into her life, directing her. I'll be a cheerleader. I'll stand on the sideline and say, sick them. And that's good for Cheryl because she can sick them. Brother Don's not here, but he's the same way with karate. I mean, he, he's opened this up to teach students and, and to give. Naomi, uh, some of you don't know this about her, but she's, that woman visits more than, than calls and visits. and follow, She has her own follow-up ministry. And never once have I come to her and said, Naomi, you need to be a follow-up coordinator. Her passion. She loves people. I just get to cheer her on and say, go for it. I'm just telling you, there, there's ministries all around us. Yvonne Dunn. You know, she takes the names of people when they put up prayer needs and she calls them and she says, listen, can I pray with you? She's one of our prayer warriors. One of them. And she has a ministry of calling and praying with people who need prayer. I'm just going to tell you, those are not led by me. They're led by the body. I just want you to understand that there's something like that that God has for every one of you. And look at what Paul writes in Ephesians. He says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, 
that He will empower you with inner strength through the Spirit. And he goes on to say, and you will be made complete with all faithfulness in life, power that comes from God. I'm going to tell you, God has what it takes to complete you this morning. He has already completed you to be able to do great and mighty things. But here's what you've got to do this morning. Three things, and these will be very quick. Number one, receive his love. See, many of us know his love but we've not received His love. There's a difference, by the way. We know He loves us, but have you received the love of Christ within your heart? Paul says it like this. It's funny that he finishes that verse by saying in Ephesians, the next verse says, and may you have the power to understand all that God's people should. Listen. Listen to what he wants you to understand. How wide, how long, how high, and how deep is his love? May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully to understand fully, that you may be made complete in all fullness of life and power that comes from God. You see, love has the power to cover a multitude of sins. And God says, listen, you've got to understand that I love you. And can I tell you, before you can receive anything from God, you've got to believe and know that God loves you. You've got to receive that he loves you. Some of you think you have to earn that love. I'm going to tell you that love's already been given. You've got to know your worth. You say, preacher, I, I've dealt with students all my life. For 16 years, me and Kim dealt with students and worked with students. And, and even as a pastor, from time to time, working with students. And I've watched student after student come in and you can see that in their life they have no self-worth. They don't think they're anything. Sometimes it's because parents spoke that over their life. Sometimes it's because they just believe that about their self. They measure their self by some other value. And can I just tell you that in God's eye, you are priceless. The Bible says that God so loved the world, He gave His only Son you see, I want to remind you today that you're not bought with a price of tangible things like silver and gold, but those things pass away. But you have been bought with that which is incorruptible, which is the precious, precious blood of Jesus Christ. I learned this when I was taking appraisal class. When I was learning appraisal, I learned that, that, that often people will modify a home and they, want, and they spend an enormous amount of money for some luxury that they want. And often that's not translated over into the value of the home. In other words, that I may love these countertops and I may spend $10,000 on these countertops, but the average person, when they look at my home, they may not see that as $10,000 worth of cabinet tops, countertops. And when the appraisal's done, they're just the same countertops as anybody else's. And so value is always equated to market, what the market will bear. You so say, where is all this going? I'm just going to tell you that when you get ready to value yourself, you need to remember the price that was paid for you. That God looked from heaven and he saw your life and he sent his only son, Jesus. That Jesus would say, Father, I'll go on their behalf. And, and the price paid for you sets you as priceless in the kingdom of God. You have to quit believing the lie of the enemy. You have to think correct, the broken way of thinking, of not seeing yourself as worth the call of God on your life. Of seeing yourself as worthy of entering into God's presence and having a divine relationship with Him. And when you do that, your prayer life changes. You realize that God hears your prayers like He hears everybody else's prayers. You have to know your value. Peter, Matt quoted this. He says that you are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, belonging to God, that you may declare praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. 
You know, it amazes me when I look at the story of Jesus and I see those disciples. And if you know anything about Jewish history, often those disciples, a Jewish, every young Jewish boy had a desire to be ingrained in the clergy and the priesthood. And they would often train and train and most of the time, by the time they were five years old, they could quote the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, word by word. And if they were really good, the rabbi would say, listen, you're a smart student. You can come and you can study underneath me. And usually by 12, somewhere around 12 years of age, they would be picked to come and follow a rabbi and, and learn in the ways of that rabbi, to follow in his footsteps learn from their master. Jesus is walking on the seashore, the Bible tells us, and he passes by some fishermen. Peter's one of them. The fact that Peter is fishing, the fact that Andrew, his brother, is fishing is a sign that they never made the cut of the rabbi. That when they passed in front of their rabbi of their local synagogue, that they weren't good enough. That they were doing what their dad had done. They were just fishermen. But Jesus looks at those guys and he says, listen, if you'll follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. All of a sudden, Jesus looks at them and says, listen, I have chosen you. And that's the same call that's here when Paul Peter writes and says, listen, this same Peter is writing and says, listen, we're a chosen people. Do you understand? He chose us. I was there on the seashore that day. I knew what it was like, the mist, the cut. And he looked at me and he said, Peter, if you'll follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. You'll never go back. He chose me. The same Peter writes and says, he chose us. Be a royal priesthood and a holy nation, a people belonging to God. I want to tell you, God sees your value and your potential, but you've got to know what your worth is this morning. And this is the last one. Hear me. Fulfill your purpose. Listen, dream. We have a group here called the Dream Team, and that's what their job is. Their, their, their job is to dream. It's not just to say, preacher, I like the idea, go for it. It's to say, how can we do this better? How can we live out the dream for this church to reach this city? How can we be that dream team, be a part of the dream team? Go through place. Find where you plug in and serve and be a part of what God is doing. Find your purpose. I invite you to the journey this morning. I invite you to be a part of dreaming a big dream. A God-sized dream that without him it would fall flat on his face. But what an amazing journey this will be. And you know what? We get to do it together. It's a, it's, it's a dream that everybody gets a part in. All you've got to do is step up and say, listen, I'm going to play my part. Ephesians, Paul writes and says, Now to him who is able to do it measurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. You see, God's working in you already. To him be glory in the church and in Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Let's pray today. Father, we're in your presence this morning. And God, maybe there's some of this place, their baggage has kept them out. They thought God can never use me. They thought that he'll never amount to anything. Maybe today they don't understand the depth of your love. God, I just removed the lies of the enemy. And what I speak is life. I speak life. Maybe you're here this morning with every head bowed, every eye closed, and and you would say, Jim, Pastor Jim, my life has fallen apart. Things are not where they need to be today. I'm not in relationship with Christ. Maybe you've never prayed that prayer. Maybe today you need to pray that prayer new and fresh. Maybe today your heart isn't where it needs to be. And you know the condition of your own heart. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you 
to come up front. I'm just simply asking you to be honest and lift a hand. You say, preacher, pastor, pray for me. I want to surrender my life back to Christ. I want to make him the Lord of my life. Come on, just lift those hands if that's you this morning very quickly. Very quickly. See that hand? See another hand? Any more this morning? See another hand? Let's just pray this together. And as we pray, just pray this in your heart. Father, today I just surrender my life to you. Lord, regardless of my past, regardless of where I've been, today remind me of what I'm worth to you. And today I receive forgiveness for my sins. And I thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. I declare that you're my Lord and my Savior. I'll serve you with all my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, come on, let's just give him some praise. You prayed that prayer. You prayed that prayer. You believe in your heart. The Bible says you're a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. I want to ask you this morning, I want to pray over you that you'll find your purpose, you'll find your worth, that you'll go on the journey with us. Why don't you just stand to your feet this morning? You say, Pastor, I'll go on the journey. How many of you will go on the journey with me? Amen? Wave at me. I want to see those hands. Father, today, we love you. And God, we thank you for this opportunity to serve the kingdom to serve for your glory, to serve. God, empower us today that, God, you've called us not just to be uh, attendees, but, God, you've empowered us to change our world. And together, Father, we're going to do it. This city has not seen the end of what you started at BFA. But, God, we're going to change our world for the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, we're going to watch you do great and powerful things. There's going to be testimonies that come. And this body, as this body does ministry. And Father, I thank you that you haven't raised a church that looks to me to do it all. But Father, through us, that we're the body, we're the church. And through us and through our lives, you're going to change this world. Father, flow through us. Flow through our life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Come on, give him praise. Hallelujah.